What's up, Reverb? My name is Anomaly. I'm a keyboardist and producer from Montreal, Canada. And today I will take you guys through the setup that we use for the Anomaly Live Show. So this setup consists of a, like a four-piece band. We are two keyboard players, a bass player who's also using a synth bass, as well as a drummer who's using this sort of hybrid setup. Basically, the three of us here uh, for our stations were using laptops and everything is based on Ableton Live. So it's a software that I use both for production at home and for live performance. I like this setup that I'm gonna show you guys because I'm able to basically just bring this with me, which is my 88 key uh, keyboard controller, and then this laptop, and then basically all my sounds that I use for my songs and releases online are available in this for the setup as well. I like analog synths, I like having a bit of hardware as well, but for just the practicality of it, this is my setup and I really, really like it. The three different Ableton projects follow kind of the same structure. Basically, the main difference is that for mine, the backing tracks and click tracks are sitting here, and all of my patch changes are automated, so I don't have to remember the sort of choreography of mapping my buttons and remembering like the 12 or 15 patches for songs. So here is uh, the project itself. This is now version seven. I use this in arrangement mode, in arrangement view. At the top, you can see these really colorful markers or indicators that basically just tell me what song we're currently on. And then if I zoom in a bit more, I can see the sections. And then basically I'm using this uh, APC Mini. It could be any generic MIDI controller just to basically navigate the set list. As you can see, it just allows me to shift through the different, different songs. At the bottom of the project, all of these tracks that are orange are the respective backing tracks. Um, in some cases, there are various versions of other tracks, such as Hang Glide here, which we play with uh, my amazing friend Rob Arajo on keys. We have a version to play with him and a version to play without him, so I can just swap the backing tracks for that part specifically. And then lower here, the green tracks are the click tracks, which go directly to our in-ears, so we can have the metronome and whatever funny cues I like to send to the band members while we're playing for the live show. So backing tracks, click tracks, and then the most important thing in my case is here. So only one track, the, in this case I called it MIDI stack, uh, it doesn't mean anything. I'm sending MIDI info to this MIDI track. This track is basically empty. It has like a velocity thing that I'm using for certain tracks. If I wanna play around with my pitch band or change some values, this is like the master MIDI track. But what this is actually doing is sending info to these groups, which are the actual MIDI stacks for e each track. So I'm using an instrument rack uh, with basically all the patches that I need, but the VSTs or AU units are not actually sitting here. So I have the piano on one, patch number two is piano plus whirly, pluck, rose, reverb, whatever patches I need for that song specifically. And then I'm using the chain selector to automate which patch is activated. So if I show you the automation, I'm basically able to prepare in advance which patch I'm gonna use for a specific section. So it's very useful. It allows me to not think about what patch I'm using, but I actually need to be really tight and plan like some sort of room for me to, to do a mistake. So let's say I'm not like exactly on the first beat. I will start like, I will cue the automation for the patch changes like, I don't know, like, uh, two uh, eighth notes before if I'm allowed to, if I'm like able to do it and I don't have anything to play at that specific moment. I'm using in some cases, let's say for the piano, the external instrument, which is then sending MIDI info 
to the corresponding VST, which is sitting lower in the project here, right here. So you'll have piano, clav, and Rhodes. And in some cases, on the actual VST itself, I'm just using the MIDI input. Just in this section right here, no input. I could just go to the MIDI stack or the corresponding uh, track stack and then choose the patch that needs to send info to it. And then basically, as soon as I go to the next track, the instrument rack is turned off, so it's not receiving any MIDI info from the main record enable track. Why am I uh, putting the VSTs on separate tracks and not in the instruments rack? I found that uh, when all of your VSTs are on one track in an instrument rack, you're only using the power of one core of your processor, whereas if the VSTs are on separate tracks, you're fully using all the uh, available core, cores from your processor, whether it's four cores or six cores, which is very, very good. You need to use a power that's uh, made available to you on your machine. And then basically, such, so I have the MIDI groups for every track, and then I have the actual patches groups for every track. And this one group, which this is patch common, it means common patches. So these are the patches that are opened for the whole set. So these are uh, pretty much all Keyscape instances. I use a lot of Keyscape and Monosphere for my pianos, roads, synths, and all of that. And basically these instruments are more CPU and RAM intensive. So I'm trying basically to use one, only one instance of those and then automating the fan, uh, different effect chains for every track depending on what I need. And also automating settings from the instance itself if I'm trying to explore like a different tone or something specific to that. And then in the actual groups here, I'll have the patches that are really specific to that one track. And then basically what happens is as soon as I switch to the second song, all of these effect chains and patches turn off so that they're not using any CPU anymore. Something like 150 uh, different Omnisphere uh, instances that are open in this specific project. Uh, so if they were all open at once, my CPU would go crazy, which is why the automation makes it uh, as stable as possible. And then after all of that is programmed and trying to practice the stuff, I optimize a project as much as I can and I, I always try to stay uh, below a certain number of the percentage that you can see here, which pretty much every DAW has. So if there's like an effect setting that was on max for like the recording part, I'll usually try to put it on a lower setting for the live performance because it doesn't matter as much you're not using headphones or really like hi-fi system. Through the patch changes, the challenge is really to learn the sort of choreography. In some cases, it just makes it easier for me because I can just keep on playing. But then there are certain scenarios like this track called No Way, where it, I was trying to basically adapt the, the part from the song, which is the lead part was made. It sounded like a chopping part or like a sampling part where you'd have like four or five different patches that just respond to each other. So I created like this huge split that automates. So it goes a bit like this. No. So there's the chord that comes in at first, and then this is actually three patches split across a keyboard. So you have the lead, the sort of chord response and then the other chord response. So it's really weird because the like register doesn't, it, this is higher than these like two parts, but it was just the split that made sense to actually play it live. So if I split bone here, split bone here. One thing that I really like to do is having this expression pedal with me. So you know how when you would play with a lead, it's all about having your right hand to play your lead parts and then your left hand is controlling pitch band and either vibrato or like cut off that, that goes up, uh, whatever you want on your modulation wheel. I would like to have parts that I can play with both of my hands and then having some effect that's specific to that patch with this one pedal. So having the patch automation and effect automation basically allows me to only bring this one pedal and have something specific to the patch without having to carry like a huge pedal board with like effects that will only be used once. Basically the pedal is assigned to effects that are in the Omnisphere instance itself uh, and then also effects that are sitting on the Ableton track itself. So there's a reverb, there's a filter in the synth 
itself, and then there's a low cut. So filter is opening, uh, the reverb, there's a spring reverb, and then an inner space unit, which is a sort of convolution reverb within Omnisphere that's opening up, and then low cut, and then coming back. So this is a bass station, and this is Gab, who plays bass for the Anomaly Live Show. What's up, Gab? What's up, Nico? All right. <laughs> <laughs> so this is the Ableton Live session for Gab's setup, which is basically, like I said, structured like the main uh, session as well. And then both Gab and Alexi are using the same keyboard as a controller like I am. Uh, so this is a Yamaha MX-61. Also, both for Gab and Alexi, an expression pedal to assign to whatever uh, effect is needed for the patch, whether it's an electric bass patch or a synth patch. So basically, since for this project there are no backing tracks and our computers aren't actually linked, where in my case I'm using the APC to basically go through the set list. In Gab and Alexi's uh, case, we're using two buttons to basically navigate through the markers. So it's the same structure where you can see the set list in colors at the top of the screen, and then using these, you can navigate through the set list. All of the synth patches that Gabby's using will be in these groups that are below, which basically are structured like the groups in the main project where they will turn on and off depending on if uh, you're on the marker of the track or not. And then the big difference here is the track stack itself. It's, it's a huge instrument rack once again. Uh, the set list is here and then the chain selector is navigating through them. But then the actual uh, like audio effects and the audio of the bass that's going in is also sitting within the instrument rack. So we're not only automating the chain selector to go through the tracks, we're automating the audio here to basically mute it when it's not needed. We need to both automate the chain selector to switch between the patches, but because two of them have audio involved, we also want to mute this external instrument instance when we switch to another one. So I'm assigning the, the on and off button of the external instrument instance to this macro here of device on. So we're basically using these buttons which send a note signal so we can have like this sort of following the scale like notes one to five to automate the chain selector. And then basically it's navigating through, through this. So one, two, three, four, patches one to four in the chain selector, but then also the device on macro is shifting. So when I'm on one, the external instrument instance is on, on two, it's off, which basically mutes the previous bass patch. So this is the second keyboard station, and this is Alexi, who plays keys in the Anomaly Live show. Hey man. What's up? <laughs> All right, uh, so for this one, basically, it's the exact same configuration as the bass one, but without the audio part, so it's much closer to the main computer session as well, but without the backing tracks and without the, uh, the, the click tracks. So it's the same structure where we'll have these songs at the top to basically follow the set list, have two buttons to switch between the tracks like this, everything is within this instrument rack. So one rack for the set list, and then a second rack within the group of the rack. So a lot of groups within groups uh, for the actual patch change automation, but which is being triggered with these buttons, like for uh, Gap Station. And then basically the interesting part is once again about being, a pl uh, being able to play around with the expression pedal and mod wheel or knobs in certain cases to trigger effects that are specific to the patch that's going on. really thick sounding like coursing and then expression pedal triggers like the sort of the de decay and release of the synth patch itself with a slight reverb. And play around with it, pretty cool. And then another example would be in my remix of Keep My Baby Dancing, you'd have like this sort of transition patch between sections uh, where the pedal will like trigger a reverb, which will be interesting to play around with as well. Yeah.
sort of create like this whoosh effect, but instead of having it program a track, you can actually play around with it in real time, yeah. which is very fun. That's pretty much it. So this is the drum station, which is basically the only station in the live show which doesn't have a laptop. And this is Anthony, plays drums for the Anomaly live show. Basically, instead of a computer, what's happening here is an SPDS. So basically, um, with this hybrid setup, I can send samples that were used for the drums in the actual recordings, and Anthony can combine them. And then in rehearsals, we end up like basically determining what is going to be purely acoustic, which is going to be purely pad, and what ends up being combined through these pretty neat triggers. All right, so that was it for the tour of the Anomaly Live setup. Once again, my name is Anomaly. Uh, you got to see Anthony on drums, Gab on bass, and Alexi on keys. Hope this was useful to you. Uh, and that you can find something to apply to your own setup for your live performance if you want to start messing around with laptops. So thank you so much to Reverb for having us as well. And uh, see you real soon. You can check Anomaly uh, anywhere online. I have basically two EPs that are out, Metropole Part 1 and Metropole Part 2. And uh, yeah, take care. Thank you.